Hi all, welcome to Quad Affection. In this video, we will discuss everything you need to know about implementing CRUD operations in ASP.NET Core Web API with Entity Framework Core and SQL Server. All the important prerequisite topics are explained in between the discussion. So let's start with creating a new ASP.NET Core Web API project. I will select this template here, C Sharp ASP.NET Core Web API. Inside this project, we'll be dealing with student data. So I will name this project as student API. We are creating this project in latest.NET 6 framework. We don't need this HTTPS configuration. We are only creating a demo project. Make sure to enable this option for open API support. It would be helpful for testing and verifying various endpoints inside a RESTful API. If you are using an old version of the framework, you won't be seeing this option for open API support here. Don't worry, I will give you an alternative third party software for testing and verifying the same. Now let's create the project. So here we have the brand new ASP.NET Core Web API project. Now before implementing the CRUD operations right away, I want to discuss some prerequisite topics. For that, along with this default controller, I'm going to create a new controller. So first of all, I will select API from the left panel and I will select this empty template here. This is only for rough works and I will name this controller as demo controller. So here it is. Now let's discuss what is meant by CRUD operations in the context of a Web API project. As you already know, the word CRUD is an acronym for the operations create, read, update, and delete. So all the data related operation in a web application can be categorized into following uh, four operations here. It can be creating a new record or retrieving one or more records from an existing collection or updating or modifying an existing record. If none of the above, it would be removing an existing record from the collection. Now when it comes to web applications, we implement them using these HTTP verbs here. So they are get, post, put or patch and delete. So these HTTP verbs are the attributes that we associate with a web API method. To give you an example, let me create a new action method or web API method here. So all the web API method must be public and it's none other than a method to this controller class here so here we go greetings now from this method we only need to return this message hello the since we are returning a string here we want to change the return type of this method as string so here we have created a web api method for this controller demo controller in terms of c sharp it's only a method to this class here a web method that is only returning something back to the caller comes under this web method here get so this web method comes under the type get in order to mark it as such we can add this attribute here, HTTP get. So reading one or more record from an existing collection can be achieved with a web method of the type get. Now, when it comes to creating a new record, it can be achieved with a web method of the type post. Modifying an existing record can be achieved with the web method of the type put or patch. I will be discussing the difference in a bit. And finally, removing an existing record can be achieved with this web method delete. We'll be discussing such web methods in a bit. I just want to give you a clear foundation on these basics here. Now, when it comes to HTTP verbs, there are a lot of HTTP verbs other than these mentioned here, but these are the common HTTP verbs that we use on a frequent basis. Now, when I heard of this list of HTTP verbs for the first time, I was asking myself why do we need them in the first place. Then later I found the importance. These are some standards for implementing web methods across any web API or web application. You could already see the common convention of using these HTTP verbs based on the operation that we are going to implement. Apart from that, we can enforce some restrictions on these HTTP verbs based on the seriousness of their operation, which we have discussed while implementing CRUD operations in Angular or React along with ASP.NET Core Web API. I have given the link in video description. Inside those projects, we have discussed adding anti forgery token or enabling course policy into a post web API method. If you are interested, you can watch that video after these fundamentals here. Now, let's try to make a get request to this web API method here. For that, let's run this project without debugging. So here we have the Swagger API interface to test and verify various endpoints inside the application. And this is what we have configured while creating this project with the feature Open API support. If you are using an old version of the .NET framework, you won't be seeing this interface here. In that case, we can go for the third party software called Postman. 
So this is the software I used to use in all version of .NET. So once you download and install this software and the corresponding interface will look like this. Basically both of these Postman and Swagger you are here can be used for creating requests into various web methods inside the project. Now currently we only have two controllers inside the project they are demo and weathercast. And inside this demo controller we only have a web method which is of the type get which is here greetings. Now let's expand this session to make a get request click on try it out and then click on execute. Boom that's it. So here we have made a get request to this web API method. So here we have the corresponding URL API forward slash demo. Now under this session server response you could see the string that is returned from the method here. And here we have the status code 200 meaning OK. We will be briefing various common status code once we create the actual controller. Now independent of the web method we can make requests into such web methods programmatically and in terms of a web application when users submit an HTML form that's also a common way of making requests into these HTTP verbs here. Apart from that when it comes to a get web method as you can see here here we have made a get request with this URL. We can make such get requests by directly entering that URL into this URL session of the browser like this. See here also we got the same output from the get web method. This is only possible with web method of the type get. For now let's stop the discussion on these basics here we will continue the rest once we set up the actual entity framework for the CRUD operation. So let's start with installing corresponding NuGet packages into the application. For that. Right click on dependencies here then click on manage and you get packages inside this browse tab search for entity framework core first of all install this basic core package here click on install accept the license now let's install rest of the two packages which are entity framework core tools and entity framework core sql server now let's install this tools package so here we have installed three entity framework core packages. You could see the same under this dependencies here inside this packages. So here we have the three packages that we have just installed. Now let's add entity framework core model classes. For that I'm going to add a new folder called models. First of all I will create an entity model for student. So here we are creating a C sharp class file for student. Inside that we can add the corresponding properties. First of all we have the student ID, the name of the student, then contact number, finally the age. Now we want to make this property as the primary key so we can add this attribute key here. Let's add the corresponding namespace. Now during migration column corresponding to these string properties will be created with the data type nvocab max. So it's a best practice to specify the data type of such string columns in advance like this. So here we have the attribute column. Let's add the corresponding namespace. Inside that we can use this parameter type name and here we can specify the data type as nvocab with the required character length let it be 250. Now for this entity student I want to make this property name as a mandatory column for the entity. So here we have the required validation. Now you could see this warning along with this green squiggly line telling that non-nullable properties must be assigned. So in order to avoid this warning here I will provide a default value as empty string. So that's enough with the model. Now as part of integrating entity framework core into this project. Next we have to create a DB context class. So inside this models folder let's add a new C sharp class file. I will name it as API DB context. In entity framework core this DB context class act as a middleware in between the actual entity framework models and the actual physical DB. So this class decides what should be the inside the actual physical DB after the migration and it is also responsible for establishing a DB connection with the SQL Server DB. So first of all we have to inherit this clause here DB context from Entity Framework Core. Let's add the corresponding namespace. Now we must provide a constructor for this clause here and there should be a parameter of this type DB context options as option. And the same uh, parameter will be passed to the base class. Now through this constructor parameter we have to specify the DB provider that we are going to use 
and a connection string to the database. That we can do in a bit inside this program.cs file. Now we have to do one more thing inside this DB context class. We have only created a model for the student here in order to create a corresponding table inside the new DB that we are going to create. We need an entity mapping to this model class here. For that, we usually create a DB set property. So here we go db set of the type student as students so after migration which is the process of converting these entity framework core models into a corresponding sql server db there will be a table corresponding to this property here and the corresponding table name will be students okay now let's create an instance of this db context class and that will be done inside this program.cs file for that actually we are going to use dependency injection now, if you are hearing dependency injection for the first time, don't worry. For now, just follow the steps that I'm showing here. I'll be explaining how it works once we create a controller with it. Before getting into that, uh, having an overall idea about this program.cs file would be better. So inside this c -sharp file here, basically we have two objects, builder and app. Into the builder object, we add services or features that we want to see inside this API project. And the same is configured with the app object here. And finally, here we have the run method invoked. That's where everything starts. Now come back to the dependency injection here. Now let's do the dependency injection. For that, we just need to call this add db context method so this is a dedicated method for creating instance of db context class and the db context class is of the type api db context so here we are specifying we want to create db context class of the type this class which we have created here okay now let's add the corresponding namespace for that you can use the shortcut control period that's it now into this method, we have to pass the value for this constructor parameter here, db context options. For that, here we have the lambda expression with options. First of all, we have to specify the db provider. For that, we can call this method use SQL server. Now let's add the corresponding namespace. Now into this db provider method, we have to pass the db connection string also. As a best practice, first of all, we will save the db connection string inside this app settings JSON file here, and then we will pass the same here. So here we go, connection strings, and we will save it under this name, dev connection. For now, I will directly paste the connection string. I have already explained in one of my previous video how to provide your connection string, db connection string. I have seen comments, people asking me how to generate this connection string here. Let me know your concerns in the comment box below. I will try to come up with a better video regarding the topic. So back to the discussion here. First of all, we have to provide the server. So first of all, we have local, meaning the SQL server is installed on my machine. So that's why I'm referring it as local. And then there is an instance of the SQL server installed with this name SQL Express. And then with this database, we are providing the database name that we are going to create. It will be created through migration and the corresponding db name will be student db. We are authenticating into it with local authentication, meaning I'm using the Windows authentication mode since the uh, server is installed on my machine. If you are using a SQL Server instance on your network, you have to provide a username and password which is configured in that remote machine. And I have said this multiple active result sets for allowing multiple queries at a time. Now let's pass this db connection inside this program.cs file here. Now in order to retrieve the connection string from this app settings JSON file, we can make use of the uh, configuration object. Just call this uh, method get connection string. Inside that we just need to pass the key name here which is dev connection. Let me copy this and paste in here. For now that's enough with the dependency injection. Here we are trying to create an instance of this db context class. More about that will be discussed once we create the actual entity framework or controller. Now, as I already mentioned, migration is the process of creating the physical DB corresponding to the entity framework core that we have. Inside this entity framework core, we only have an entity model, which is student. So corresponding to this entity model, there should be a table with the name students having these properties as columns. That's what we do with migration. For that, first of all, we have to open package manager console. You could see the same inside these tools here, tools, then in you get package manager then package manager console 
in my IDE here, you could see the same inside this bottom panel, Package Manager Console. Now along with this, keep this Solution Explorer as opened. Now here we have to execute two commands. Before executing those commands, first of all, try to build this project here. Make sure that the build is successful and there is no error. If there is any error, fix that first before the migration, okay? Now here is the first command, add migration, and then let's provide a name, let it be initial create. Now regarding this name here, for each modification that we make inside this entity framework core, we have to do a migration. And in order to identify those modifications, we can use this name or label that we have provided here, okay? Hit enter. See, as a result of this DB migration, here we have a new folder with the name migrations. Inside that we have few C sharp files and just look at this file here, which is having the same name initial create that we have provided. So all the modifications that we are going to make inside the new DB is specified in terms of C sharp. With this command, we are not altering anything inside the DB. We are only creating the C sharp file here for the changes that should be made inside the DB. Now in order to apply these changes, you have to execute another command called update database. Hit enter. See here we have a problem. Connection was successfully established with the server, but then error occurred during the login process. So understand this, most probably it would be related to the connection between the DB or the SQL server instance that we have. Now talking about this DB connection string, you could verify the correctness of the DB connection string by actually logging into the SQL Server instance. In my case, I'm using SQL Server Management Studio. Then use the same credentials provided in the connection string inside this login window and try to connect with the DB. Since we have successfully connected to the SQL Server, it verifies that there is no error in the given credentials or the address of SQL Server instance. This error is new for me, so let's search for an online solution. Select this error message, right click, then copy, back to the browser, paste it over here. Looks like Stack Overflow already solved this problem. In short, because of a recent update, we have to pass trust server certificate as true inside the DB connection string. Since it is a recent update, most of you might be having this error, so let's paste it here. Make sure to provide semicolon at the end. Let's build this project again. Back to the package manager console. Let's execute the command again. For that, you can use upward and downward arrow for navigating previous executed commands. So here we have the command update database, hit enter. Boom, that's it. So it looks like everything went successful. First of all, let's refresh this databases node. So here we have the DB student DB. Now let's check whether we have the table students. Let's check its design. Each column is created as per we have given inside this model here. So that's enough with the Entity Framework Core and DB creation. Back to the project. Now let's get into the meat of this tutorial, which is implementing the CRUD operations within a Web API controller. So right click on this controllers folder, then add controller. Now select API from the left panel. Instead of implementing the CRUD operations from scratch by choosing this empty template here, I'm going to stick with this template with actions using Entity Framework. In that way, we can save the time for implementing the operations from scratch and we could use more time for explaining related concepts. So let's stick with this Entity Framework core and that's what we do in a normal project also instead of starting from scratch. Now click on add, inside this first drop down, select the model which is student, then db context, that would be api db context, the name of this controller, I will name it as student controller. Boom, that's it. Now while creating the first controller with entity framework or model class, you might get an error like this saying that there was an error in running the selected code generator. I have already made a specific video to fix the problem. You could see the video in iCard top right corner. Also given the corresponding link in video description under the session related videos. So here we have the controller, student controller, which is created as a result of scaffolding mechanism. So all the web API method for implementing the CRUD operations is already added into the controller here. Now I just want to explain how it works with necessary details. Now before getting into that, I want to explain how dependency injection works in ASP.NET Core Web API. So let's start with the basics. So every API controller is a class which is inherited from this base class here, controller base. 
And that's what makes this class is a controller inside this API project. And here we have the controller constructor having this parameter as API DB context. Now let me ask you this question. From where do we pass an instance of API DB context into this constructor parameter context here? That can be explained with this dependency injection here. So first of all, an instance of this controller class will be created once we make a request into any of these web API methods. That's for an instance of this class student controller is created and it is done by the ASP.NET Core framework itself. At the same time, we have to pass this constructor parameter of the type API DB context. That's for dependency injection comes into the picture. Because of this dependency injection here, an instance of the API DB context class is created by providing the value for its constructor here. See, the value for this constructor is passed within this statement here. And this DB context instance will be passed to the controllers having this constructor parameter of the same type. It's all happening behind the scene of ASP.NET Core. And the same instance is assigned to this private read-only property underscore context. And rest of the web API methods here make use of this underscore DB context to interact with the DB through Entity Framework Core. So hope you understood how dependency injection works in ASP.NET Core Web API. Now let's check how these web API methods implemented the CRUD operation. For that, we are already running an instance of this application inside the browser here. We just need to build the project in order to reflect the new changes. So let's build the solution once again. And after successful build, back to the application. So here we have the new controller student and having these web API methods. First of all, let's examine this get web method here. Before getting into the web API method, let me brief the routing inside this application here. You might be familiar with routing in ASP.NET Core MVC application. For example, here we have an ASP.NET Core MVC application implementing expense tracker application. I have already uploaded the corresponding video demonstrating building this project from scratch. I have given the link in video description. You could check that after this video here. So for those who are familiar with MVC application knows that this is the default routing configuration inside the program.cs file. We specify first of all, we have to provide the controller, then action, then ID. But when it comes to web API projects, this is how we configure routing. With the app object, we have just called this method map controllers. And in each of the web API controls, we'll be having this tag or attribute route. So here we have the base address starting with API forward slash it became as a common convention in web API projects to start with this base route API forward slash. Then the name of the controller. For this controller, this placeholder will take this uh, student here. So API forward slash student is used to consume web API methods inside this controller. You could see the same inside this swagger UI here. See API forward slash student. So all the web API methods inside this controller will have the same routing API forward slash student. And then based on the type of the web method, it can easily map the corresponding web API method here. And we can even be more specific in case of this get web method here because we have two get web method. One is accepting an ID argument here and the other without any argument. So that's how routing is configured in a web API method. Now let's get back to this first get method here. So here we have the get web method without any ID parameter. And here we have the get method with the ID parameter. So first of all, let's look into this get web method. If you are familiar with entity framework or you could easily tell that this is simply returning all your course inside the entity students table. You see here we have the DB context class. Inside that we have this property DB set. In order to interact with the student's table, we'll be using this DB set property here. With this method, we are trying to retrieve all of the records inside the table students. Currently, we have not inserted any record into it, so it will return an empty array. So this will return all of the existing record from the corresponding table. And with this method, we are just trying to convert this DB set property into a list. Now, before getting into the further details here, let's try to make a get request to this web API method. So click on try it out, then click on execute. Boom, that's it. So here we have made a get request and this is the corresponding URL. See, this is what we have specified inside the controller here. 
And here we have the root URL with the port number. So this request will reach up to this web API method and it is returning all of the existing record from the corresponding student table. Currently there is nothing inside that so it returns an empty array like this. Now back to the web API method again. If you are a beginner in sp.net core web API, you might be frightened to see this return type of this web method or these keywords like async or await. Let's discuss that also in brief. Now let's go back to the initial controller here, demo controller. Within that we have created a simple web API method which is only returning a string like this and thereby we have this return type string. So most frequently in real world projects we will be returning a complex return type like this. And there will be situations rarely though we need to return a simple data type like this string or integer. We'll discuss that in a bit. Now these keywords async and await keywords are used for asynchronous operations. By default all the operations are synchronous meaning if we make an operation right now it will only get executed once the previous operation is completed. But in case of asynchronous operations, we can execute multiple operations at a given time and thereby one operation does not need to wait for other operation to complete. So that's the basic concept of asynchronous and synchronous operations. So whenever we make an asynchronous operation, we have to prefix that operation or statement with the keyword await. By default, all the operations are synchronous operations. In order to execute a statement asynchronously, we call the async version of the method like to list async instead of to list method. And we have to prefix the statement with the keyword await like this. And the web method having at least one asynchronous operation should be marked with this keyword here async. So that's all about the keywords async and await. So currently inside the students table we don't have any record. Now let's try to insert a new record. For that we can make use of post web API method like we have explained here. So here we have the method post student and which is marked with this post attribute. Inside this method we are inserting a new student record that is passed to this parameter here. Now in order to better understand this post web API method, I'm going to put a breakpoint here. Now I'm going to run this application with debug mode so that when the execution reach up to this method here or this breakpoint, the execution will be paused and from there onwards we can see what's happening step by step inside the IDE here. So let's run the application with debug mode. So here we have the same interface and let's make a post request with this session here. Click on try it out. Before executing this method we have to provide a JSON object corresponding to the method parameter student here. That's what we are going to insert into the corresponding table. First of all we have the student ID property. I will keep it as zero. It doesn't matter what we provide here because it's auto generated inside the SQL server. You could see that inside this table here the student ID column is is the primary key for the table and if you expand this column properties here you can see that it's an identity column meaning we don't have to pass value for this column it will start with one and incremented by one upon new record insertion so whatever we pass into this id property for a post or insert operation it doesn't matter because it is going to be auto generated by the sql server itself by incrementing the previous inserted id by one you could easily map these properties with the model class here student. Here we have student ID, name, contact number, age. You could see the same here also. In C sharp it's a common convention to name properties or variables in Pascal casing. That is each word first character will be uppercased. And if there is any abbreviation all of them will be uppercased. See? But when it comes to JSON objects, it's a common convention to use camel casing. Meaning each word first character will be uppercased except the first word. For example, let's look at this property here. Inside this property, we have two words, contact and number. The first word contact first letter is lowercase and the other words first character will be uppercase. Same in case of the student ID also. So while receiving this JSON object in this web API here, it will convert the same into Pascal case so that it will perfectly map with these properties. And the exact opposite will happen when we return an object from this web API here. It will convert from Pascal case to Camel case. You could see that in a bit. So hope you understood this difference in naming convention. So we'll keep student ID as it is. Now let's provide a name here. 
then contact number, age. Normally in a client side and server side application, we make a post request by submitting the form and the data from form controls will be passed as a parameter. Now let's make the post request. Since we are running with debugging mode, the execution is paused at this breakpoint. So that post request reach up to this line here. Now, if you hover on this parameter student, you should see the corresponding data that we have passed. Now we're gonna insert this record into the student table. Now, in order to see line by line execution, you can click on this uh, step over button here, or you could use the shortcut F10, or in latest IDE versions, you can click on this button here, saying run to this line here. So I'm gonna use this button here. So the execution reached up to this line, and here we have the student object that we have passed and the same will be added as an item inside this db set here currently there is nothing inside this db set now in order to run this line here click on this green button on the next line now if you hover on this db set you could see the count is one that is the new student object is added to the db set now in order to insert the same into the corresponding table students, we have to invoke this method save changes. If you check this table, there is nothing inside the table because we only added the object to this DB set here. In order to insert the same into the corresponding table, you have to invoke this method save changes. So let's click on this green button on the next line. Now let's execute this query again. See, here we have the newly inserted record. Finally, here we have the return statement by invoking this function created at action. So basically this function create a response which returns newly inserted record details back to the caller. So I'm gonna continue this execution here and thereby this web method execution is over. Now back to the browser. Now let's check what are the details this interface is showing. We have made a post request into this URL and we have passed a JSON object and here we have the object that we have just passed and here we have the server response. Inside this response body you could see the newly inserted record returned from the server. All of these properties are that we have passed inside this request but the newly inserted student ID is auto generated and you could see the same inside this return object as one. From now onwards, newly inserted record ID will be incremented like two, three, four, etc. Now along with that, you could see the response header here. It is having additional details. First of all, content type as a JSON object that is indicating the return object is also a JSON object and thereby the convention from this Pascal casing here is converted back to the camel case. So that's how the conversion happens from camel casing and Pascal casing. Along with other less important details, you could see this location here saying that if you want to know more about this JSON object, you can make a request to this URL here. So the overall response is generated because of the function created at action. Once entity framework insert a new record, the newly inserted record details will be updated inside the object student or the parameter here. And the same is written as a response. That's what we can see here. And this URL of the newly inserted record is created because of these two parameters. It's actually creating a new URL to this web method get student. We have two get student method, but here we are passing an ID also, ID parameter of the newly inserted record. So this method get student with the ID parameter is mentioned. Hence, a new URL to this web API method is written. That's what we can see here. Now, in order to know more about this student, we can make a get request by using this URL. Instead of making this get request with this uh, session here, this get session with the ID, I'm gonna make the get request inside this new tab, boom. See, so here we have the student details with the ID one. As I already mentioned, this get verb method is invoking this method get student with the id parameter here we're going to discuss what's happening inside this web method here in a bit before that i want to talk about this status code here 201 you could see another status code when you make a get request so let's check that with this first get web method which is actually trying to retrieve all of the records inside the table we have already made the request previously but we got an empty array now we have a single record inserted let's check what's the output 
boom here we have the array containing the inserter record now look at this uh, status code here 200 so let's check what this status code implies so all status code contains three digits and all of them can be divided into these five categories here status code starting with one indicates protocol level information and all of the success response starts with the status code 2 indicating whatever we meant with the web method is successfully completed status code starting with 3 indicates the operation is transferred to other action method if there is any error making the request or passing the data in client side such request response status code will start with the number 4 if the error is inside this restful web api then such response will be having the status code starting with 5 now let's get familiar with common status code in RESTful web APIs. So first of all, we have the status code 200 meaning success. The operation that we intended with the action method or web API is successfully completed. That's what we have seen with these get web methods here. After successfully completing the web API method, if you are returning an object as it is, as you can see in this simple method, we are returning a string, same in case of these are get web methods so whenever we return an object as it is we will get the status code 200 let's check that here so here we have the get web method an array of the student objects we got the status code 200 same in case of this demo controller here let me make the same get request again here we have the same status code 200 so our web api methods returns an object directly will have the status code 200 now we have 201 meaning created. That's what we have seen in case of this post web API method here. While inserting a new student with the post web API method, we got the status code 201. So that's the reason for wrapping this response within this function invocation here so that it will return the status code 201, meaning a new record is added to the student's collection successfully. And there is one more status code 204 indicating no content, meaning there is nothing to be returned as important or something useful back to the client side. But that's not mentioned in this list here, but you could see that inside this put web method while updating a record. We'll get into that in a bit. So if there is nothing important to be returned, in that case, we can invoke this method and that will give the status code 204 no content. And here we have few status codes starting with 4 indicating there is some error while making the request from the client side itself. So first of all we have bad request response. The common reasons are the data that we have passed to the server is not valid. For example, inside this entity, student entity, we have made this name as mandatory. If you are trying to create a new student without passing this name, then the appropriate status code for the response would be 400 meaning bad request. Let's try whether it is already implemented to this web API by default or not. So I'm going to make a post request without passing the name here. So click on try it out. For this property name I will pass null and let's populate rest of the properties. Click on execute. Boom that's it we got the response 400 meaning bad request and you could see the exact reason for this error the validation of the name field is failed now the state is called 401 and 403 are related 401 says we are not authenticated to access the web api most probably when we give a wrong password or username we get this response 401 and here we have the status code 403 indicating forbidden. We will get such a response when we are trying to access a web API method outside our permission. For example, under the role hierarchy inside the application, we got the HR role where we have to add new students into the application. If you are trying to access web API methods meant for administrators, we will get this error 403. It's not configured by default inside this application here, but I have done such tutorials previously. You could find the link in video description where I have implemented both user authentication and authorization. And here we have the 404 response meaning not found. Whatever we are trying to access, it's not present inside this web API here. For example, we made the get request with this URL which is trying to retrieve existing records from the table. So here we have the array with the student record. Now, if I misspell this URL here, we will get the error 404. 
So that's how this not found status code works. And finally, we have the status 500. The status code starting with 5 indicates that there is some error inside the Web API implementation here. So that's the basic overview of status codes. Now back to the controller. So far we have discussed this get web API method to return all of the records from the table and we have tried and explained how this post web API works and we have also seen how to make use of this get web method to return a specific student record with the given ID. Here is the corresponding web API method get student with the ID parameter. Let's make a get request to the web API method using a given ID. We already have a student with the ID 1. Let's try to retrieve the same with this get web method. So provide the ID here, click on execute. So here we have made a get request with this URL API forward slash student forward slash the ID. And here we got the success response with the status 200. So here is the corresponding student record. So let's look what we have inside the web API method here. So first of all, the ID that we have passed through the URL will be received with this ID parameter. With that, we are trying to retrieve the corresponding record from the table. So here is the DB set for students table and we can call this method find. Since we are doing this using asynchronous method, we can call the corresponding version async version find async and we just need to pass the corresponding id it will retrieve the corresponding record back to this variable here and here we have the if clause to check whether there is a student with the given id here suppose the id is 2 currently there is no record with the id 2 in that case this will return null and this if clause will be true and we will get this not found response which is status code for not for meaning not found what you are looking for now, if the ID is present inside the table, then we'll return the student. That's what we have got here. So far, we have discussed create and read. Now, let's talk about update operation, which is implemented within this method put student, which is of the type put. And here is the sample URL to this Web API method. After the student, we can pass the corresponding ID. That is the ID of the record, which is to be updated. And it will be received with this ID parameter here. And the updated value of student entity will be the inside this parameter. So first of all, it will make a comparison with the ID from the parameter here and the property inside this student parameter here. If they don't match each other, it will return a bad request resulting in 400 status code. If they match each other, we can go ahead with the update operation. For that, we just need to change the state of the entry that we have passed here. So first of all, from this context object, we just need to mark the entry student state as modified. Since we are passing the student object here, it can tell this is from the collection students and using the primary key student ID, entity framework can detect the corresponding record. And here we are telling that there are some new changes inside the entity. Now, in order to make it physically inside the table, we have to call this method save changes like we have done inside this post web API method here. I think there is no necessary for step by step execution like we have done with this breakpoint in case of this post web API method. So by invoking this method, new changes will be reflected inside the table. Since there is a possibility of concurrency exception by invoking this method here, we have wrapped the same with the try catch block. Now talking about concurrency exception. Assume that we have two users, one of them is trying to update a record and another one is trying to delete the same record. So allowing both of these operations simultaneously compromise integrity of data. So there comes concurrency mechanism, only one of them get the chance to execute the operation. So if there is a simultaneous operation, this is how it is handled. First of all, inside this if close, it will check whether the given ID is still present or not. And that is handled inside this method here, student exist. For that, from this DB set, we can call this method any and trying to check if there is a record with the given ID. And it will return a Boolean value indicating whether the record is present or not. If it is not present, we will return not found response. Otherwise, we will throw the concurrency exception. So that's how concurrency mechanism works. If the operation is successful, then we will reach up to this return statement. Here we are returning the response no content that is status code 204. Since the status code is starting with 2, we can say the operation is successful, but there is nothing to return back to the caller. So that's how the web API method works. Now let me try to consume the same put web method to update this first record with the ID 1. So I will do this, click on try it out, 
and I will pass one here. Like we have done with the post WebAPI method, here also we want to pass a student object with the updated values. And that will be received with this parameter student here. And the ID will be received with this ID parameter. Now let me pass the corresponding values. ID will be one. Let's change this name. Same contact number and same age. Click on execute. And here we have the response with 204 status, meaning the operation is successful. And inside the DB, I re-executed the select query and we could see the updated value here. Now that's all about the update operation. In here, we have implemented the update operation with the put web method. Instead of that, you can also use this HTTP verb patch also. But in case of this patch verb method, the usual convention is that we are only trying to update a part of the record. For example, consider a to-do task application where the common operation would be changing the status of a task to complete it. So in those situations like when we want to update a part of the record, this patch web method is recommended. But in all other update operations, put web method is used. Especially if you are trying to update the record from an HTML form where the user can make changes in any of the fields or the properties. So that's all about the update operation. Finally, we have to discuss this delete web method. Before getting into that, let's discuss various return types that a web API could have. It's a different topic for another video, but in order to be confident in these CRUD operations here, having an overall idea in this topic will boost your confidence. So the return type of a web API method can be divided into these three categories here. First of all, a specific type. That's what we have inside this simple web API method. It could be simple primitive data types like int, boolean, then string or an instance like this. But most of the time we may need to return multiple types of data from a single web method especially when there is a conditional statement or a try catch block. In those situations, we have to use this return type here, I action result. When I action result becomes the return type, we have to return the data within status code like this. So this will return the status code 200 along with the data that we have here. Now, if there is any condition to be checked inside this function, we may have to return different data types. Now, assume that here we have an else block and inside that we are returning no content like this. So this is possible since the return type is of the type I action result. Here we are returning 200 response with the data here and here we have a 204 response. When we are using I action result as a return type, we can't directly return the data like this. We will get the error that this type can't be converted to I action result. So in order to make it even possible to return a specific type like this, we can use this return type here action result and here we have to specify the type as string that's it now inside this controller web methods here we are wrapping the return type or action results here within task it's because we are making an async operation inside this web method in those cases the return type must be wrapped with this task like this okay now let's discuss the final web method which is delete so here we have the corresponding routing API forward slash student then the ID of the record which is to be deleted and it will be received with this ID parameter here and first of all it will retrieve the corresponding record to this student variable and inside this if clause it will check whether there is a student with the given ID or not. If it is not present for not for not found response will be returned. If it is present, we have to delete the record with these two lines of statements here. First of all, we'll remove the item from the DB set students, and then we just need to call the save changes method like we have done with the insert and update operation. And once we successfully delete the record, we will return this no content to not for response. So here we have the delete web method. Click on try it out and provide the corresponding ID. Click on execute. Boom, that's it. We got the response to not for no content. So the operation is successful. You can check whether we have deleted the same from the corresponding table here. Re-execute the query. Boom, the table is empty. You could check that with this get verb method here. 
So here we have the empty array indicating the corresponding table is empty. So that's it guys. You can download or clone this project from the GitHub repository link given in video description. If you found this video helpful, please consider subscribing to this channel if you haven't yet. Please like and share this video with your friends and colleagues. Have a nice day. Bye.